Hello and welcome back to my crazy electronics projects where I go through my Mega Wang 2000 Turbo Edition video and audio hardware. This connects to the Commodore 64 and provides greatly improved video and audio capabilities. At the top of this board we can see the three resistor ladders are larger compared to the previous board and this helps to provide RGB 565 colour also, the RAM chips to contain the pallets are much larger and allow up to 32 independent pallet banks. The soldering on the reverse side is very neat and I'm very happy with what PCBWay have delivered. Uh, this design, all I needed to do was assemble up all of the design files and then send all of that information to PCBWay and they just sent me back this board and it looks wonderful. Compared to the old board, you can see that the old board in the top right hand corner there uh, uses through hole components. There's also a very hacky uh, daughter board on there to provide background color masking functionality as well. This, all of that functionality is baked into this board. Here's the board in situ in the board stack. And here I'm just running the emulation of what we should be able to see. The emulation is actually just using Java code and I've assembled this up for the Commodore 64 as well. The emulator, the Java emulator rather, just runs Commodore 64 code or cartridge files. And so I can send the same, ver same code to the Commodore 64. And now this is the hardware that you've just seen, the board stack running and producing an output. The output is actually 60 frames a second and this version of the board stack has four independent layers plugged into it. It has uh, two uh, 8x8 character display layers. It also has a 16x16 pixel tiles layer, plus also, oh, actually there's a scale sprites layer, which actually isn't plugged into anything right now. And also there is a normal 16x16 pixel sprites layer as well. There's also this great big board in front, which is the APU, the Advanced Processing Unit, which allows synchronization of hardware register updates with the raster beam as it traverses across the screen. This hardware targets 60 frames a second because that's what the old arcade specification video output used to be way back in the day. So this demo splits the multiplex sprites between the top and the bottom as well. That's why you can see many more than 24 or even 31 or 32 sprites being used. And that's because the APU, the Advanced Processing Unit chip, comes along and then triggers a raster interrupt at the correct position, basically, and then updates the hardware registers to update the hardware registers for the sprite hardware at different timings so that the first half of the sprite display is, is rendered first and then once it gets down to roughly the middle of the screen it flips over to the second set of sprite registers or rather it updates them from its internal memory and then displays the sprites down at the bottom. These sprites are actually mostly 2x2 two two sprites welded together to create 32x32 32 32 pixel sprites or up to 32x32 32 32 pixel sprites. The colour fading in and out is actually using pre-computed palette banks that uses the palette bank functionality of the new hardware. Here we can see the improved uh, RGB 565 color bit output. So these greens on the old hardware, you would be able to see some horizontal bands quite clearly, whereas with this new hardware, the greens are a lot more subtle. And that's because instead of uh, four bits for the green, it's got six bits for the green. And the old hardware was RGB444 and the new hardware is RGB565. This demo is the Shadow of the Beast demo, but because it's using the new hardware, the colors look a lot better than before. Basically, the graphics that were converted from the Amiga uh, has much improved color resolution compared to the older RGB444 demo. It also makes heavy use of the APU to time all of those raster effects for the different parallax layers of scrolling. It also uses sprite multiplexing for the sprites up at the top of the screen, for the blimps and the moon, and also the player character down at the bottom. There's quite a lot of splits 
in this demo and actually I could probably include improve rather the color depth of the faded sky as well which I'll probably do when I'm updating this demonstration to take advantage of the new hardware effects. I could probably pre-program some of the uh, palettes and then just switch to the new palette like banks. I've got the TV screen active there as well so you can actually see the Commodore 64 outputting to the TV at the same time that the Commodore 64 is sending graphics updates to its expansion hardware. So effectively the Commodore 64 or my C64 has got two screens. This is the emulated output of uh, Demo 9, which is available in the SDK. It makes use of the expanded or the scaled sprites hardware. As you can see, it makes sure that you can see that they're scaled sprites by scaling them up and down in a very unsubtle way. Uh, the board stack that I've got plugged in at the moment does not have uh, another characters layer being used at this point in time. So one of the layers of parallax scrolling is missing. But the main point of running this demo is to check that the background uses the uh, improved RGB 565 output. And it does, and there don't seem to be any bugs compared to the emulated output for the background. So that's a successful test of this demo. Running it again, you can see the nice little whooshy sprite effects for the scale sprites coming in. The sprite sheet at the beginning is actually scale sprites as well. There's some subtle scaling going on as well. So the, the scale sprites hardware is much more capable actually than the, un, the, the, than the not scaled sprites uh, hardware layer. But um, the number of sprite definitions is slightly reduced in the scale sprites hardware because I didn't want to have so much memory compared to the uh, non-scale sprites hardware. They have different functionalities basically and different use cases. The scaled sprites layer is harder to multiplex of course whereas the uh, non-scale sprites layer is easier to multiplex because the timing for the non-scale sprites layer is deterministic, whereas the scan line timing for the scale sprites layer is uh, harder to figure out. It's still uh, deterministic, but uh, it's a lot harder to figure out where you should actually be putting the timing for uh, in, in the horizontal scan line for where you should be updating uh, the scale sprites layer, whereas on the non-scale sprites it's a lot more deterministic. The APU uh, can precisely uh, time the hardware register updates horizontally in each scan line. So that's why it's possible to add better multiplexing for the non-scaled sprites. And that's because you can time your register updates to avoid the sprites as they are being plotted. This demo here is the final demonstration of the palette bank capability being used with the APU. Now this has four distinct palettes being used on uh, the image in the same screen and this is a demonstration of the improved RGB 565 rendering or color depth capability and of course if you are familiar with the old Amiga D-Paint or Deluxe Paint demonstration then that is the King Tut demonstration graphics file which I thought would be a nice little addition. So this color wheel, you can see here that the palette bank uh, or the palette information is being updated in these four bands using the APU, using its raster-based interrupts. I'm then decompressing the character data into memory from the Commodore 64. So that's why we went from random initialization or randomly initialized memory on power on to actually seeing the character data. And then here uh, I'm using the Commodore 64 to then update and decompress new character data for this new screen, which is the King Tut mask. So the Commodore 64 is perfectly capable of decompressing large amounts of graphics data. Uh, the compression method used on this is just simple RLE compression or run length encoding compression. It's really quite 
easy to decompress because all it needs to do is stream the output bytes to the user pod and it can do that uh, one byte at a time without needing to worry about writing back into the Commodore 64's graphics memory. Uh, this, the, this demonstration here that I'm running is just to show that you can go from, or using the Commodore 64 can go from the uh, color wheel and King Tut mask demo back to the Shadow of the Beast demo. The vertical lines of extra graphics data that you can see here are actually uninitialized, um, non scaled sprite registers that haven't been updated properly and that's because I haven't updated this graphics demo for the Shadow of the Beast demo to initialize those graphics registers. Actually it's rendering some you know, sprites, sprite configurations that haven't been initialized yet. So then here I'm just resetting and then going back into this demo again and of course you could see that the old Shadow of the Beast uh, data that was left around in memory from the previous execution and then it decompressed the color wheel and then the King Tut mask image over the top of that and they basically look the same there's the emulation on the left and then the real hardware on the right the code is really quite simple for this demo all it needs to do is just decompress uh, the the memory into the right place and then there's the APU code here which basically waits for a certain raster line position and then updates various different or updates the pallet bank registers at the correctly timed position on the raster line. There's the instructions and then there's the data part for the APU because the instructions and data are held separately. And then there's the decompression of the data. So that's the end of this video. If you like these kind of like crazy electronics projects that I'm working on for expanding video and audio capability of the Commodore 64 and also other retro 8-bit retro 8 games machines, then please do consider liking or subscribing to my channel and I hope to catch you around next time. Have a great day wherever you are.